Hi, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you might be. Well, welcome to our two o'clock session on day three of Azure Data Week, dedicated to Azure SQL Data Warehouse and event-driven analytics with Abraham Samuel. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Abraham and let him get started. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Abraham Samuel, and I am one of the um, one of the technical specialists, technical architects on the Microsoft Americas team for data warehousing and analytics. And today's session is going to be uh, focused on the SQL Data Warehouse. It is the MPP solution in Azure that is um, dynamically scalable, and there is going to be a lot of announcements coming up especially in about three to four weeks at Ignite. So we're really excited about that. And I wanted to kind of talk today a, a little bit around event-driven analytics. So normally I want to kind of give a little bit uh, coverage on what the content will be today. So wanted to kind of talk a little bit about just data warehouse and common scenarios. Um, I'm sure if you are, um, if you're familiar with data warehousing, you probably have a lot of familiarity with the common scenarios. But what the Azure Data Warehouse, uh, since Gen 2 came out um, a little while ago, um, what, what has been done is specifically to move a little bit beyond just relational data, uh, data that's collected from a lot of our operational data sources. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then the focus will be a little bit on data factory some of the features that are there in Data Factory to help us um, specifically with data flow and then also the event-driven capabilities that are coming in uh, in Azure. <clears throat> then we're going to talk a little bit about, and one item that's not in this is we're also going to talk a little bit about Azure Functions. So you can see how you can leverage Data Factory and Azure Functions to um, be able to take uh, take it to the next level specifically on um, in Azure with event driven capabilities. So that's the focus. And then we'll go into <clears throat> some of the patterns around uh, data ingestion, uh, the tools that are there available to be able to take uh, the standard loading with Polybase. You've probably heard of that, which is external tables. Um, and then we also have features for streaming data, um, and there's going to be a lot more news coming out soon. Uh, there is also a preview command called copy command uh, that is going to be in the data warehouse to be able to quickly go and just pull data in, let's say, directly from blob storage or uh, a data lake, et cetera. And we, there's also um, features in preview right now for the data warehouse to deal with heterogeneous data. Uh, so dealing with a lot of documents, uh, JSON documents, et cetera. So let's get started and let's hey, go. Abraham, through. can I interrupt real quick? Mm -hmm. People are requesting if you could remove uh, the boxes at the bottom left. Usually if you just move your mouse off of the screen, it goes away. Uh, the boxes at the bottom left? Yeah, so the video of you and you might have to turn your camera off for that too. So sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> so sure. Cutting off some of your text on your slides. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, you're good. You might see a weird screen here. Um, yes. <laughs> how do I? Sorry. Like if you hover over yourself at the bottom left. Yep. Right and then you can just hit the um, little, that one. Yep. There we go. Is that better? Hopefully that's a yes, little bit Yes, it is. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, great. All right, um, so let's keep going and go through some of this content here and talk about really the Azure Data Warehouse from a, from a perspective of value, right? When you are thinking about analytics, what is the actual value of the data, data warehouse and how is the data warehouse positioned in the Azure portfolio? Specifically, it's positioned for petabyte scale analytics. It is not for transactional workloads, right? It, the, the back end of the engine is built to answer big questions. So basically big queries basically uh, with lots of data coming back, uh, let's say into your Power BI, Tableau, et cetera, cache, um, Excel, et cetera. So some of the key value is from a price performance side 
it is uh, ninety four percent less expensive, right? These are some of the key um, items, and there are actually documentation behind it. If you're interested in it, we can definitely send it to you uh, from a um, industry leading standard wise. Obviously, um, there is a extensive um, defense in depth is very important to Microsoft. Microsoft invests a lot of um, resources and um, capital on security and that is one of the key things you will see that if you're familiar with sql server security right all the security features that are there in sql server nearly all of them are here in the azure data warehouse if we do get time i can go through kind of a, a table list of feature by feature so if you're basically if you have familiarity with uh, SQL Server on-premise or Azure SQL database, you will be very familiar with um, with this MPP system, even though it is a scaled out architecture. From a security perspective, all the security is there, which is very important to customers, and spe specifically customers in so many of our variety of industries like finance and healthcare and things like that. And then on top of that, you also get the SLA uh, that's uh, financially backed SLA. So that's actually a pretty powerful thing. Um, one of the key features here is that it differentiates the data warehouse versus other cloud MPPs is the intelligent workload management. So not only is there a sep separation of storage and compute, you can actually prioritize resources so that your most valuable workloads, think of it, you know, a lot of times we say, hey, the CEO's uh, reports or the CEO level or the C-level uh, reporting needs priority at some times, or maybe the large weekend loads uh, with uh, coming in from data, coming in from disparate sources, right, needs to be loaded quick and in a timely fashion. That's where the prior, uh, prioritizing the resources really comes in and shows kind of uh, the value of the data warehouse. And then there's also a data flexibility, by the way, for workload management. We are going to have some very, very powerful announcements coming in um, at Ignite. So uh, look forward to hearing that. That's actually going to be pretty cool. The other thing is from a data flexibility side, the ability <clears throat> to be able to support not just structured data, right, but semi-structured data also. Um, things such as, you know, from Parquet files to JSON. Um, and so various formats are now supported in the data warehouse with Gen 2, and it's gonna keep expanding so that you can kind of, you're able to build uh, so much flexibility that you can actually think of the data warehouse as uh, like SQL on demand, right? So you can actually say, hey, I need SQL analytics on demand and I'm a data scientist or I'm a business user. And uh, all you have to do is just literally know that, hey, this is my favorite tool that I use for analytics. It could be Power BI, Tableau, whatever your favorite, or it could be um, a notebook where you're just running queries from, or it could be, you can just run the query and point to the data warehouse. Uh, it is just simply an endpoint, just like SQL Server. You point to that endpoint, you securely connect to it with the credentials, and you are just simply running a query and you don't have to worry about under the covers <clears throat> what is going on. You just get answers to the question to your corporate data that you're looking for. So that's actually a lot of data flexibility and developer productivity. Um, this is something very in, in Azure specifically from an enterprise application lifecycle management right, uh, from uh, Visual Studio uh, onwards for CI, CD, et cetera. Enterprise develop, uh, development for SQL Server is there with um, <clears throat> extensive support. And for the data warehouse, all that support capability is there. There are some features that are in preview, especially in Azure DevOps. They'll be, um, you know, it's, it's expanding daily. So from a productivity side, specifically when I wanna, let's say, replicate an environment uh, or I have a copy of it somewhere very quickly, that actually helps me as a developer. It's actually a very powerful uh, tooling for me to be able to leverage. Uh, a few other things that I just wanna kind of note down regarding the data warehouse is that it is across, it is available across, um, you know, there's Azure has 54 regions 
from worldwide 41 Microsoft managed um, regions across. So we have the data warehouse available across the globe, wherever you need to. If you need to keep a replica, right, um, in one part, you want to keep it for DR purposes or something else, you have that capability to do that. If you want to bring up a replica with a snapshot in another totally different region, uh, in another, um, you know, in a region and in an area, of, let's say you're in New York or, for example, Eastern US and you want to bring something up in Europe, you have that flexibility to do that. So the geo expansion is extremely um, powerful for because you are working with cloud scale here. Um, so let's go through some of the common data patterns and I'll kind of try to go through this quickly so that we can keep up with the time, right? When you're talking about just nowadays, not just big data, but general data, any kind of corporate data, any kind of big data you want to call it, there is um, the ability, we want to be able to use the data warehouse. We want to integrate all the data, right, into a data warehouse so that specifically you can serve it to your applications, specifically to your reporting applications, to your self-service applications, um, and even uh, serve it back to the data science, machine learning analytics as you need. So that's actually an important workplace. And then you have the advanced analytics. We're trying to predict something, right? We're trying to predict uh, customer churn, for example, or, or it could be a wide variety of things that you can do with uh, machine learning and advanced analytics. And then there's real-time analytics where we are trying to get insights uh, from our devices or um, from, from our applications that are on the web in near real time. So there's various, um, big data uh, solutions here. The one thing is the modern data warehouse extends really the scope of the data warehouse to serve big data needs, right? So, and that's where um, the data warehouse Gen 2 um, is specifically geared towards. And as newer and newer features come in, it is built to give you answers. It's built to give you insights on large amounts of data uh, very quickly, and you're able to bring it together uh, and extend. So it's not just your regular relational ETL. You're able to bring in uh, unstructured data. Um, I'm sorry, a semi-structured data, uh, JSON data, and things like that. And to be able to combine it with other corporate data, and to get, to be able to get um, answers and insights to your uh, to the questions that that serve the business. Um, so. For the modern data warehouse, this is just a simple diagram of an overview of how things are done today with our Azure customers across the world. And they leverage this. Not only do they take this, these are pretty much all native PaaS services in Azure, PaaS and SaaS services in Azure. But then we also have many partners, for example, um, that have marketplace solutions in Azure that our customers also take and leverage all the time. We have a lot of um, very critical partners, for example, in the ingest space, there is a native service, obviously, and I'm sure you've, if you've worked in Azure with anything data related, right, it is the workflow for data centric applications. So Azure Data Factory is there. It, it's a native pass solution that's available to you, serverless. Uh, it's a great solution to be able to bring data from on-premise um, cloud data sources. It has, uh, we'll go a little bit more detail into it. Um, so it's actually a very important solution, but I wanna actually give you a little flavor of the ingest process. Um, if you are familiar with another solution and if you've already purchased something else, you have that ability to bring it into the cloud. I have customers that all the time leverage things like uh, tooling from Informatica, who is a huge partner in, in Azure. Uh, we have customers like Stream uh, for uh, when we have customers that need to, for example, deal with CDC, right, change data capture, and they want to be able to um, go through that and bring that into um 
into a data warehouse for analytics and reporting, et cetera. So that's where they use Stream. And there's there's hundreds of Tallinn. There's there's a lot of partners out there that do a great job with ingestion. Uh, Azure Data Factory is just the native service that's there. Uh, it's great to use, um, and I use it all the time. Uh, but at the same time, we have a lot of customers that use partner services. Same thing on the prepare side. Uh, the, this, these toolings that I mentioned, the Data Factory is there. It's a first class citizen in Azure um, that that you can that you can leverage. But then there's also other tooling, right? If you're dealing with um, large data sets, that's where Azure Data Factory can actually call data bricks. So you can uh, you can just have a data bit bricks task that goes in and does some something for you, some processing for you if you want, or something much more, right? If you want to not just do processing, but then at the same time, maybe you want to do some sort of a classification or some sort of a machine learning, you can actually do that with Databricks. You have this ability to be able to do plug and play here, right? And you can use our partners um, services like Informatica, et cetera, for the prep phase, um, and then uh, transformation and enrich uh, that's also another phase that we have our customers using native services or a variety of other partner services. And then the serve is there, which the data warehouse is doing. And you have Data Lake Gen 2 at the bottom where it's a, you know, it talks about the Data Lake um, Gen 2 storage. I don't know if you are familiar with Gen 2 storage. It uh, came out a few months back. The key thing is the ability, it is built on top of blob storage to be able to handle big data. So things like when you put in a Parquet file into Data Lake Gen 2, you know it's optimized storage by default. It's spread, split across, um, uh, split across the board to give you that HDFS compliance, right? So that's actually a really cool thing with Data Lake Gen 2. Uh, you can also use blob storage, uh, but then if you want unlimited stores for very large files, that's where the Gen 2 comes in and plays really well. And Gen 2 can be plugged right into Databricks if you want, but then it can also be plugged uh, directly with Polybase into Data Warehouse, and you can read data really quickly. And we'll take a look at that as we go through some of the additional information uh, today. So from a visualization perspective, obviously uh, I'm biased towards Microsoft, B, uh, Microsoft BI and Power BI. So I have that listed on there, but feel free to use your favorite visualization tool, uh, not a problem. But at the same time, I would say, hey, give Power BI a try if you have never tried it. I love the tool. Embedded analytics is actually some one of my favorite aspects um, that I used to do with a lot of customers where they can actually embed Power BI and do a self-service engine for um, for different clients, et cetera, which Power BI gives you the capability to do. So let's go jump a little bit more into how, why we're talking about event-driven analytics uh, with the data warehouse. If you've heard the buzzword, like the modern data warehouse um, or data analytics, in Azure, it is talking about the data warehouse and this process right here. What we've seen is as both customers and cloud data warehouse providers, we've seen kind of a shift in how customers are approaching um, the whole concept of uh, data warehousing with cloud technology. As we see more and more customers coming in and um, using Azure Data Warehouse, we've seen changes in pattern, right? So from an ingestion perspective, um, <clears throat> Connectivity and high-speed networking um, are there to be able to make the process, right, make it possible if you've used, for example, Azure, you know about ExpressRoute, um, how you can leverage ExpressRoute and how you can actually set up um, 
high-speed network throughput from your uh, on-premise sources, like data centers, to continually ingest data. So you have this ability to have a constant pipe in there um, as a cloud customer. The other thing is from a storage perspective, a big data score, you have the ability for highly scalable and cost-effective storage in the form of data lake, right? And you have hierarchical storage, which makes it possible possible for you to have a very, um, you know, you have a hierarchy there. It is organized. It is not, you can actually organize it to be able to serve different needs, right? If you want to layer it with raw data layer and different staging layers, there's another layer, let's say, that, um, or uh, parts of uh, depending on what applications and what raw data is coming in, you have that flexibility to be able to have it all organized in your data lake. And you have um, unlimited scale, which is actually you know at a very cost-effective price. So that's actually a pretty powerful solution. From, from an exploration side, right, we have seen a lot of customers wanting to do this. And that's where um, they want to be able to, as a data engineer, or even a power user who just has access to Azure, like an Azure, um, uh, an Azure subscription from your organization or personally, to the ability to explore the data is actually pretty powerful, right? And you will see there's a lot of tooling that you probably heard the last few days, right? Uh, have a lot of features. So uh, the concept, if you will talk about with Data Factory, you will see we've put in preview a lot of new tooling in the data factory for you to be able to preview your data very quickly. And then uh, you also have, if you're talking about big data, right, you have the whole Databricks uh, Spark native engine that's running in a scalable mode. And you have you can use your favorite notebooks to be able to, again, explore that data, right? From exploring it, you have the ability to go in and prepare it. Uh, you have the ability to transform it. Uh, you all have the also the ability to be able to train it and train training what we're talking about training prep and training from a data science perspective that's where azure ml i think you you've had some previous um, sessions on azure ml which is really powerful for prep and train you're if you're talking about um, huge scale analytics data breaks comes in so you can actually bring those notebooks let's say and tweak it a little and use it on data breaks if you need when you're talking about high amounts of high volume volumes of data. So you have that. We have customers uh, going in and they want the ability to explore data processing engines and services are used more ad hoc, right, for data exploration, new analytics and data processing engines um, with Spark being leveraged to prepare data and train models. And then serving it, uh, that's where serving it they want to have um, customers want the ability to have a data warehouse or just simply a big data so a store that you can quickly access different styles of data not just the regular relational data but then hey i also have a lot of semi-structured data i want to just use sql which is a very popular language right you go into uh, a financial shop um, and a financial analyst most likely they've use SQL. You go to any power users that, that are familiar with some level of coding or some level of they've worked with data, they have some familiarity with SQL. They, so, and then at the same time, the data engineer, uh, the data scientist, it's pretty, they have also a lot of familiarity potentially with SQL. Um, and it's not a very complex thing to learn, right? The basics of SQL. So we have customers asking, hey, how can we just simply be able to go into a whatever the big data store is? I just want to be able to use that SQL and start um, start being able to query the uh, query my data and start getting insights. So that's where the model and serve the data warehouse comes in, and it plays a critical role 
um, to for all your BI reporting needs uh, for various real-time analytics. Uh, think about the scenario where you can actually stream that data. Um, let's say you're using Databricks or some of the other technology um, with event hubs and real-time data is coming in. You have that. Uh, you have the ability to take real real-time uh, data and stream it into the data warehouse, and from there report on it but the great thing is that data doesn't go away right you have the ability to partition and hold that data the real-time data for a lot of other purposes and a lot of other analytics needs that you're going to have as an organization so that's kind of like a high level let's jump in a little bit more um, and we'll talk a little bit about data factory at this point uh, where event-driven analytics really comes into play Data Factory is the go-to native Azure service, as I said, right? It is a pure um, pass service. So you don't have to worry about, hey, how many nodes am I spinning up and things like that? How many uh, VMs or uh, things like that? You don't have to worry about any of that. You simply can start ingesting data very quickly from other cloud sources. Right, that's the easiest thing. Yeah, and then the other easy thing is on premise. They, uh, there is a connector, and there's um, there's basically just like you would have, let's say, with Power BI, like a gateway. Right, you have this gateway with Data Factory, and you're able to um, integration runtime is able to land take on-premise data very quickly and be able to pull it in with Data Factory. And you can also connect to various SaaS applications. Um, and as you pull that in and you start preparing it, you can temporarily store it in blob storage or Data Lake Gen 2, depending on the size of the data and what you need to do with that data. You have that ability to do that and quickly pull that into the data warehouse. And then, you know, you've heard always ETL, right? Uh, think about ELT, right? Extract, just load it quickly, and then I can transform it. And then at the same time, you, you also have the ability with Data Factory and the features that are there. It's not just for workflow. Um, it's also, you can actually do a lot of transformations with it. So you have a workflow which, which actually has uh, various types of uh, transformation processes that you can actually associate it with it and you can ingest and prepare that data as you need. And then <clears throat> that's where you land it in the data warehouse and you use your BI tools from there. So what is um, some of the some of the key things right in the data warehouse that it's going to give you the ability to be able to do uh, analytics, serverless, scalable, hybrid, but the key things are here. Um, as you know, the data factory, you might have already had many sessions on the data factory, but the key, uh, some of the key things around um, the background around event-driven analytics is that ability here to be able to go to your enterprise data, right? If your enterprise data can land, let's say in a in a blob storage, we're able to quickly process it, right? So, but then not only that, if you want to actually run things like SSI as package executions, you can do that. You have the ability to not just author directly on um, from the Azure portal into um, into the UI, but you can also monitor uh, programmatically, and uh, you have various SDKs and visual tools to kind of uh, go through that. So you have this ability with the Data Factory to do um, extensive amounts of workflow and processing. It's a it's a great uh, ETL tool that's built for you, that's serverless, hybrid, and scalable. So when we're talking about Data Factory, right, the whole point here is you don't have to worry about a lot of coding. Um, and if you've used Data Factory, you know what I mean. Um, and it's it's very, very straightforward and easy to uh, easy to kind of use. Um, and I'll just show you guys quickly uh, what the data factory right uh, looks like. You're probably already familiar with it. You have your pipelines. Um, you can quickly, as we said, you know, 
there's actually activities right here if you wanted to run databricks for some reason if you want to run databricks if you just want to do a copy task right you want to take some data that's let's say delimited or json or something like that you just want to quickly bring it in uh data factory gives you this code free or minimal code um interface to be able to run your pipelines and that's actually what we are going to leverage when we talk about um, when we actually talk about event-driven analytics, right? It's one of the tooling that you can leverage with Data Factory. There's, I think, over 80 connectors available across multiple, you know, across Azure regions um, to be able to. Some of the key things is copy and rerun with checkpoint support. That's actually pretty uh, pretty powerful. And if you're familiar with other ETL tools, including SSIS, right, you, to have checkpoint support, it's actually a really great feature that you can leverage in the cloud. Um, and we have seen many migrations from, let's say, Redshift, uh, Netiza into Azure, and they've um, they used to use, let's say, an on-premise um, ETL tool, et cetera, right? They've just seen that it's much more cost efficient in Azure to use the data factory. So um, that's actually uh, that's actually pretty powerful uh, across the board with all these connectors that are available to you. So let's actually take a look at some of the new things. Um, you might have already tried this out, but this these are things that you can quickly use. This the stuff is in preview right now, uh, so I just want to tell you that it, this is in public preview. Uh, mapping data flows. Right, the mapping data flows gives you that code-free data transformation at scale. Um, so you can actually quickly, and you saw it right here um, when I had data uh, data factory open here, and you can see that it's also data flows is available. So if you wanted to quickly get started with the data flow, you can actually get started right off the UI. Um, the other thing, wrangling uh, data flow. Wrangling data flow is also where you want to go into that data and you want to do a lot more transformations, right? You want to fix things. You want to, um, it's similar. You can see that UI here looks very similar. If you have used Power, U, uh, Power Query, um, it looks similar to that, but it, it just it just gives you the power to do that with um, large amounts of data, which is actually a really nice capability that's available in Power Power um, Power Query, which is part of Power BI, and it gives you and also data flows in um, in Power BI gives you that. Now uh, the wrangling data flow is also available with Data Factory, which is definitely something. If you are a data engineer, this is kind of like hey you're in the house uh, you're in your own house basically that's very the familiarity there is actually pretty powerful so event driven pipelines right where does everything come into play here right the key is the data factory but then how do we actually what are we talking about here and where does everything kind of fall into place? I'll just put all the arrows together so you can see what event driven, uh, how does event driven um, analytics work with uh, Data Factory? This is where you can actually, so Data Factory uh, recently had um, a new feature based on, um, you know, based on events. So let's say data comes in from streaming like event hubs, let's say that's just an example, or some business applications or some SaaS applications that you have on premise, right? We have customers, for example, uh, using something like MuleSoft that's on premise. Um, they have been using it, but then in the cloud, in Azure, they wanted to actually use Data Factory. So what do they do? They just drop the data off into blob storage. Um, or as you said, if you have events that are being streamed, streaming data coming in from event hubs and the data eventually lands in blob storage, you can do kind of different things with it and land it in blob storage. Or if it's coming in with Kafka um, and event hubs together and it lands in blob storage on the at the moment when the blobs basically arrive um, and the data actually arrives there it will automatically kick off a data factory job. So the data factory is kicked off and that workflow 
gives you right away now you have that workflow to load it load that data directly into the data warehouse and do transformations etc from uh, or you can actually take that data and put it into data bricks if you want if you need to do some other types of preparation you have that capability to do that also or you can also as we talked about before right if you if you are leveraging a workflow you can uh, leverage that workflow in the data factory process it and land it in the data warehouse House. So that ability to, as um, based on events, automatically data factory is able to do it. And how is how is it do? Um, how is it able to do that? We're going to kind of look into that a little bit later. Now a little bit different architectures here, and we'll kind of take a talk a little bit about that. How can you actually, um, if you have data coming in from other business applications and you want to actually do something else so you have and especially if you're a developer centric organization where there's developers and if you've heard of azure functions azure functions is another great way to leverage event driven analytics so what again uh, based on events there's something called event grids that's available that's behind the scenes working the magic here uh, so without having to need to pull uh, and things like that we are able to simply on the arrival when data arrives um, in a specific service such as web storage in our example we are able to now uh, we are able to process that and kick off an Azure function automatically kicks off. Now the Azure function can do basically whatever you write in that code, right? And that code could be C sharp or that code could be Python. Um, and it'll just run, right? You can you can have whatever, like if you want to actually have it call Data Factory, you can do that, or you can actually even vice versa. You can call Data Factory and then call another Azure function if you want as as part of that processing. You can even have Azure function, for example, and the Data Factory call other um, other tooling. Whatever level of processing you need in Azure, you are able to use uh, simply REST APIs and um, and the code that's there in Azure Functions to be able to do your processing and land that data um, in the data warehouse for uh, serving your um, for all your analytics needs and your reporting needs. So it's it's pretty cool. Um, and what's behind the scenes is the uh, event grid. So if you're not familiar with the event grid, it is you know. It's part of the Azure serverless application platform. So Azure serverless is really the key was it used to be uh, Azure functions. Event grids was like kind of like uh, the key thing where it manages all events that that can uh, trigger code or logic. Right. And you have Azure functions. It's basically uh, serverless functions that execute your code based on events. And you can have it. Uh, there's different ways to configure its code so you can do whatever you want. And there's also logic apps, which is a UI driven workflow, very similar to Data Factory. The difference between logic apps and Data Factory is Data Factory is very data centric. And that's why the name is Data Factory, right? So it's a workflow, design a workflow that's specific to your data needs. Logic Apps, it's more about enterprise integration. So you have, for example, if you want some when some kind of email comes in or something else or some file comes into certain ftp or some application there's uh let's say in your crm application or in your um um, in one of your other SAP applications or one of your Oracle applications, uh, some data changes. At the same time, you want to, um, when that change happens, you want to be able to have a workflow kick off in the cloud that maybe calls a bunch of, maybe pulls a little bit data out and calls a bunch of other tooling, such as you might at the end of the day land some data in a, in a database, like a data warehouse or something, or a SQL server, or it might uh, be that you want to design a workflow that's around intelligence. You can actually do that with Logic Apps. So it's actually a very powerful thing for 
enterprise integration. Um, and there are there have been confusions where, hey, where does Data Factory co come in with uh, versus Logic Apps? I have heard customers ask that. And the answer is Data Factory is data centric. It's specifically for your data workflow needs. Logic Apps is full enterprise integration so yes it can handle data but not the not specifically to the way for example a data factory underneath there's optimizations uh, when you're loading data with data factory to a data warehouse it leverages poly based technology um, logic apps on the other hand it's it has a few hundred connectors, its real power is to be able to go to various applications that you have running SaaS, PaaS, um, and on-premise applications that you have. And depending on some change occurring, you're able to kick off a workflow very quickly. And that orchestration process gives you that capability. So Event Grid, though, is the intelligent event routing service that kind of brings a lot of our um, native services and a lot of our partner um, services uh, to be able to to do serverless compute and act upon um, act upon events basically and you don't need to have some kind of polling going on right because you just leverage event grids here so that's actually a, so with these services um kind of combining you can um it basically azure provides a host of managed building block services right so again plug and play comes in very handy here and i always call the, these as like lego blocks right to build out an enterprise analytics and not just enterprise analytics but enterprise integration um, enterprise online processing applications and and so much more right iot applications so it gives you the ability uh, with these building blocks to uh, for different services such as Cosmos, databases, storage, analytics with data warehouse, cognitive services, you know, IoT. Um, and these services can, util can be very quickly utilized by developers to build that serverless architecture that you want to build in your, um, in your environment. An example, right, of what what is an example of this kind of a, uh, a scenario? And this is actually, we have some customers doing this, and this is very powerful, and this is going to be expanded upon at Ignite, where we're going to have even more power that's going to be handed to uh, um, to developers and data engineers and uh, simply power users. You want to have a lot of, for example, there's real-time telemetry data that's being collected from from a variety of sensors or from a variety of devices and you want to be able to process this data in near real time here's where azure functions can play a major role to be able to bring that data azure functions and even combining it with something else also you have this ability to bring you know, such as uh, let's say data bricks uh, to be able to quickly bring that data into a data warehouse for reporting. Yes, you can do some real-time reporting with, let's say, Power BI connected to um, uh, connected back to your IoT for some real time, but the data goes away, right? You want to be able to, in one shot, do real time, and at the same time, to be able to have this data available to you to do historical analysis, do, let's say, time series analysis and things like that, that's where really the power of data warehouse combining with the real-time tooling and event-driven analytics uh, comes into play. So just a little bit more about the data warehouse. We are running quick, so I want to kind of uh, focus a little bit back into now that we know how to actually do event-driven analytics. And I'll just show you quickly. Um, let me go to the data factory, for example, right? Um, for the data factory, it's really easy if you wanted to actually start building event-driven analytics. So what that means is, let's say data gets dropped for right now, right? The data factory supports when data gets dropped into, um, into blob storage. So let's say you have a bunch of applications, or you can try this very easily today. Use something like Data Explorer, right? Use something like Data Explorer, 
and drop a file, uh, drop a file into uh, into a blob storage, and you can quickly test this out very quickly. The key here is, let's say you have a simple copy data job, you have a trigger that actually drives um, drives the whole thing. So if you have a trigger that's available, um, it is actually and it's event driven. Um, you can actually you can actually set that up very quickly to be able to go in. For example, uh, let me cancel this one and show you how to create a new trigger. So there's actually multiple ways to kind of do the same thing here. You can, when you're actually coming into an activity, you can create a new trigger here, or you can actually create a trigger down here. So for example, if I wanted to, I already have one, but if I wanted to create, um, create a new trigger for, uh, for here, I can go in here and say, hey, I want a new trigger. And let's just keep it 101, something like that. The key here is right here, instead of on schedule, I want it event driven. And then you will select your subscription and your storage account, et cetera, right? So you can just select uh, whichever subscription you have. Um, you can select, let's say, your storage account that I believe the only requirement here for your storage account is it should be a version two storage account, which most of the, you know, unless you have a very old storage account, all the new storage accounts should be able to support it. Now, if you wanted to migrate something, uh, let's say you do have an old storage account and you want to migrate into a new storage account, it's very easy and quick. What I would say is if you've heard of AZ Copy, which is a tool where it allows you to quickly, um, let's say you have on-premise data, right? And you have a lot of data that comes in from a bunch of feeds every day. You want to just be able to run a job with your favorite job tool that you have on premise and push that data into a blob storage for event driven analytics. You can use something as simple as AZ Copy, which is a free tool that's available. Uh, download the AZ Copy, it's a command line tool. It gives you the ability to be able to go from on-premise to the cloud at uh, very quickly move move that data very quickly and you can actually put in uh, there's a few advanced options in that tool which is very nice because it gives you the ability to you know sp specify things like the amount of threads etc to use to bring uh, large files over into azure uh, pretty pretty you know, pretty robust tool there that's freely available, um, AZ copy. So you can use that and you can use that also to move data from blob to blob. So if you wanted to, if you're using an old version of Gen 1 and you want to kind of say, hey, I want to leverage the latest stuff, I, I need to use Gen 2, you can simply take it from a Gen 1 blob and just have a job basically that traverses across um, all your folders, let's say, inside a blob and just moves over all the data into your Gen 2 and keeps that structure also. So that's actually a pretty useful tool. Um, just command line, you can just run it, let's say run it from an Azure VM or something like that, or wherever wherever you want to run it, and it'll, it will just uh, kick off and you can just um, use that, leverage that to move data around very quickly. And you can use that also uh, as part of your automation if you if you want to work it that way. But then there's also a lot of other past services, which, uh, which are probably better way to go. Um, so you just select the container and then here, let's say you just say, okay, I want it to go to a folder called sample, oops, sample one. And that's pretty much it, right? So you can also put end blob end with, okay, so what are my events that I want? So here I want blob created. If you want it to be blob, blob uh, deleted, you can select that also. Um, you select that. Is it active? Let's just keep it not activated for right now because um, I have another one already. Right away, it recognizes. If you have a bunch of files, I just put a test file in here right now. <clears throat> if you wanted to um, just put file, it'll automatically detect that. And right there, there you have a trigger. And now you use that trigger across your pipeline um, and it will automate that and um, go forward with your data factory job so it's it's pretty fluid and it's very easy to use um if i had time i can also show you uh how you would leverage that with functions right that's also a very powerful capability um 
that if you want, I can send you some links if you're interested. I will, uh, when I put the slides up, I'll send some, I'll put some links in there um, around event-driven analytics. So you have that, you can kind of use the, um, or you can just search for Azure Data Factory event-driven um, on your on your favorite search engine, and then it'll probably be uh, up there as like the top result. Um, so from a data warehouse perspective, right across the board, one of the key things, um, a lot of our competitors uh, specifically try to say, hey, we run better. But the truth of the matter is at the end of the day, um, a data warehouse that was built in the cloud in Azure for scale, right, and with thousands and thousands of enterprise customers, right? We've been able to get through with Gen 2 and some of the features that are coming out with Gen 3 across the board. It's the industry leading for price performance. And these are testing that was done with uh, TPC, uh, TPCH um, data and uh, benchmarks were done. And there's actually a white paper on that. So that's actually you're working. The great thing to know is you are working with the fastest performant data warehouse in the market. The other thing is from a security perspective, right, compared to many of the competitors that are there in the market today, um, industry leading security that's um, that's across the board. If you're familiar with, as we said early during the beginning of the um, session, if you're familiar with um, SQL Server security features, you can see most of all the SQL Server security features are there. Even data in use, always encrypted, that is that will be coming very soon uh, for the data warehouse. So across the board, um, you know, one of the key things I would say for the data warehouse is like when you're working with enterprise data, you need certain times depending on what are your what industry you are. You might need SQL auditing. Um, you will need, for example, nearly everybody needs authentication and network security and threat protection. Right, and then based on your needs, you can you might need um, additional data protection if you're dealing with PII data, and that's where really from an industry leader perspective, from a security uh, in Azure, or Microsoft kind of stands out. This data warehouse solution uh, stands out, very similar to how SQL Server also stands out across the board. Uh, industry leading compliance. I'm not going to focus on that right now. A few things about uh, data ingestion. If you are not familiar with the data warehouse, I just want to kind of quickly um, quickly throw out here, right? So one of the common challenges for kind of building applications is really managing credentials in your code and uh, authenticating to cloud services, et cetera, right? Keeping the credentials secure is obviously a very important task. So what we want to do ideally is the credentials, you'd never want it to appear on developer workstations and aren't checked into source control, right? It's very common. So the Azure Key Vault provides a secure way to secure uh, our credentials. So you, you can actually store the credentials, the secrets, and other keys. But at the same time, your code um, has to be able to kind of authenticate to the key vault and retrieve them. And that's where there is a feature in Azure um, by default with Azure um, Active Directory called Manage Identities. Um, whenever you're leveraging the data warehouse, you can actually leverage, even when you're leveraging it with Data Factory or Azure Functions, et cetera, with this event-driven architecture, this is actually quite important uh, to be able to use the managed identities for Azure resource features in Azure Active Directory and resolve this issue, right? The ability uh, to, the feature kind of provides Azure services with an automatically managed identity in Azure data um, from Azure AD. So you don't have to um, keep passwords in your code and try to manage that and or uh, you know try to figure out other ways to manage that managed identities is a great resource in azure to just leverage with the data warehouse you can use the identity for authenticating to any service across azure that supports azure ad authentication uh, so it's including you know key vault without any credentials in your code um, the managed identities for azure uh, is it's free they're built in Azure AD, and we just simply, if you are using Azure, you have Azure AD. Um, definitely worth it to secure 
uh, leverage man managed identities to kind of resolve this problem of, hey, how can I actually, um, you know, not have any of these credentials sitting in my code? I, that, it, I think it's a great feature to leverage offhand with event driven architectures also. This is kind of the standard architecture for um, for data warehouse. So this is kind of uh, where Azure Data Warehouse has external tables. So what gives you the ability to be able to import and export data very quickly from Blob Storage and Data Lake Store and various other stores. Also, you will see that external tables were something that was uh, that came as part of the data warehouse. Uh, now, uh, regular um, SQL Server and um, SQL DB supports some of those features, right? So um, we've been able to share the code, right? Polybase enables users to run queries, uh, import, export data residing in the Azure Data Warehouse. Um, you can basically write T-SQL, a SQL language that everybody's familiar, people, you know, a lot of people are familiar with to read, um, read and access data to external sources and we leverage this. this is the most performant way to be able to leverage it and this is where with polybase also you can actually have um you can create your credentials right uh and you can actually this is one way you can also use it with managed credentials across the board uh and leverage it because of time i'm just going to kind of go through some of the new features here if you're not over um aware of it, one of the best parts of the data warehouse and kind of like my favorite feature is uh, CTAS statements. If you're, if you're not familiar with it, it is absolutely great way. If you use like select into and things like that with regular SQL, CTAS is kind of like the same thing, but really be able to, if you're working on, for example, if you're a data engineer and you're working on optimizing your data warehouse and you're trying to figure out, hey, what's the best way to spread the data across all the data warehouse node distributions, right? Uh, CTAS gives you the ability to quickly switch back and forth between different hash keys, right? To check what the data skew is. You don't, you wanna eliminate data skew inside the data warehouse. You want um, to be, uh, what that means is you're splitting the data evenly across all your distributions that are there in uh, across your compute nodes. And that's actually, uh, CTAS is probably, you know, it gives you a statement as a parallel operation and it creates new tables based on the output of select statements. So you can actually use this quickly to go from staging to production, from raw data store, right, such as external locations like Blob into a staging table. Um, great, simple, fast way to create copy tables, right? And that, that's actually really useful. I'll quickly go through it. Something, oops, um, let me just, I lost my place here for a second. Um, Yeah, so CTAS is here. The one feature that I wanted to quickly give you a little bit um, glimpse into is we've made it even, we're making it even easier. There is a copy command that's coming in into the data warehouse, which gives you direct copy um, for various file formats. You can quickly copy it from any blob storage uh, and various other data lake locations, simplify loading into a data warehouse, access directly from external storage uh, sources, fully parallelized, scales with across the compute, no dependency on managed objects. Uh, there's not even a need for external tables at this point. If you just wanna quickly bring in data, few lines of SQL will give you this ability to be able to uh, bring data very quickly uh, into, into the data warehouse. That is actually something that's coming. Uh, the other thing that's here that's in preview that's really, really useful for event-driven architectures is the ability to handle heterogeneous data, right? You can bring raw, uh, raw JSON data directly into the data warehouse. Let's say it's a Varkar max, uh, Varkar field. Um, I would say, you know, depending on the size of the 
uh, JSON, you can use the right size for Varkar, let's say. You read the JSON data, store it in um, basically a string column, and then use these functions. Um, and if you're familiar with SQL, these functions are there. But for the data warehouse, when you're talking about real-time, near real-time applications like IoT, and you want to have um, near real-time analytics and then but also you want to be able to archive that for time series analytics and various occasions this is actually really useful and you can actually pull the raw data for example into um uh, into a string column and then uh, from from that point you can pull out and put the um, put specific values right json values across from different different fields and you can actually take that and put that into your production tables etc so this is actually a really powerful capability that is there with inside the data warehouse today that you can leverage with event driven um, event driven analytics and event driven solutions that you're building specific for analytics use cases. So my time is running out, so I wanted to kind of uh, end it here, and I wanted to um, make sure that I answer all the questions. Is there any questions? Yeah, there are. Okay. Um, all right. How uh, would I access the questions? I'm going to um, just read them off to you, or okay. there's a the question thing at the bottom if you want to look at that. Either way. Uh, yeah, you can just read it. Read okay. it. It's probably quick. Sure. With all these Lego blocks, how do you proceed to deploy a complete solution in various environments? Before we had these various um, VS solutions, SSIS, SQL, et cetera, that we could deploy to various environments to all these Lego blocks support solutions in Visual yep. Studio. Sorry, this is pro probably a big question. <laughs> no, 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 no. It makes perfect good. sense. It makes perfect sense. A great question, actually. Um, so yes, it is built right. Like you know, one of the one of the slides we looked at is something like this, or the slide before with Data Factory. We talked about it. Hey, these are all kind of like Lego blocks. How how do I leverage this, right? So one of the key things is remember that you can actually when you develop this and you when you develop. Um, I don't know if you have used Azure ARM templates right oh let me actually show you something when you are actually deploying anything either in the portal or uh, from PowerShell etc right one of the key things is the Azure let me go into Azure here make sure you leverage arm templates I'm run out of time but in Azure in the portal right the first time you deploy it let's say something for test or QA you can when you're creating this Azure arm templates give you the ability to as you're deploying all these Lego blocks put together kind of a JSON structure that's what Azure uh, arm templates are so you don't have to rewrite and reclick and etc right you automatically for example instead of I don't have, uh, I, I deployed everything a few days, so I don't have any new notifications. I was going to see if I had, um, basically you package up the template and now for your QA or your production, you're able to redeploy it very quickly. And you can adjust the JSON, for example, in there or tweak it. Um, and the cool thing is there is a UI that is available to tweak it. So you don't have to sit around and tweak the JSON itself, right? There's a UI uh, with ARM templates that you can simply go in. And when you're redeploying it, for example, to QA or production, you might need um, a little bit more horsepower for your data warehouse, right? So you can specify the uh, DWUs. You might need a few more compute um, CPUs for some other service, right? You can specify that. So Azure ARM templates is probably one of the easier ways to go around. I hope that answers the question and I hope that was the question. Um, hopefully, any other questions? Yeah. Um, can ADF directly grab data from Azure Event Hub without going through storage blob? Um, ADF, I don't think today can uh, grab it from directly from Event Hub. I don't think Event Hub's um, endpoints are not, uh, Data Factory is not one of them. So what you would want to do is something like a stream analytics, right, can be hooked up with Event Hub. That is probably a better way to go. Um, so I can take a look at if there's anything coming up in the future that supports something like that. But um, wait for the announcements that are there in Ignite, which is literally like 
three to four weeks away, right? I think it's November 4th or something like that. It is, so yep. it's, Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of announcements for that. So wait for that. And you can email me. Um, no problem. I'll try to get you documentation on what's the best approach in that kind of scenario. Awesome. Thank you. We do have a couple more. Um, Logic apps versus Data Factory, are they both the same? Uh, yeah, I don't know if you, they're not the same, right? Data Factory is a workflow tool specific to data architectures, right? When you want to move large chunks of data around and process it, that's where the data factory, so the name kind of gives it away, right? It is a data factory. So it's specific to data uh, workload, right? And workflows. Logic Apps is enterprise integration. So it can do a lot of things, but not the efficiency that's there in data factory on the back end to handle large pieces of data that is not there for um for example logic apps if logic apps let's say there is an integration uh application that you're building with logic apps and there's at some point in the workflow you're dealing with large amounts of data that's where you simply call uh data factory as you need or some other tools such as databricks to handle that that heavy um loading of the um, of the data or the processing of the data i hope that makes sense okay um, data sync versus SQL replication versus polybase to get the data into cloud. Uh, data sync. Data sync is no good to get the data into cloud. Data sync is good for cloud to cloud. I'll be clear about that. I we have done customer performance. It's even though it supports on-premise sources, it is not meant to do near real time. Like if you're familiar with the replication, right? Replication is pretty darn fa fast. We, I work with a customer that was kind of like the largest transactional replication customer um, in the United States, uh, actually in North America, that uh, tuned, tuned SQL 2008. I know data replication, right, when, um, SQL replication, I'm sorry, SQL replication is pretty fast. So data sync does not have that speed behind it when you go from on-premise to the cloud. So that I wouldn't recommend that as the option. What was the other two options? Um, uh, Polybase and data poly sync. Data sync is not the option. I would recommend um, using something that brings the data such as data factory that allows you to bring the data into blob storage and then um, leverage polybase or data factory automatically leverages it, polybase so use data factory and enterprise um, run to integration runtime to bring the data into a temporary data lake right in the raw folders or a blob storage and then from depending on the size of the data and then from there let keep putting the workflow together and push that into data, uh, data warehouse where it will automatically leverage Polybase for you. That's probably the quickest approach. If you really want to get down and dirty and you don't want to use uh, data factory, you can also use, as I said, AZ copies a tool, but then you have to skid. It's just a tool kind of that's a command line tool right so you have to somehow have a scheduler that is able to run that for you so that's also something that's out there that's available in native but then there's there's a lot of other tools but data factory is probably the preferred approach okay great well that was the last question so thank you so much for staying a little bit over and answering questions no um, thank you everyone for attending again thank you abraham for a great session we really appreciate you joining us for azure data week and we hope you join us in the next couple sessions. Thanks, everybody. Have a great conference, everyone. Bye-bye.